Welcome to Abundance. You guessed it, a podcast dedicated to all things surrounding dance. I am Kristen. And I am Hannah, and we are two best friends who are brought together by this art form. Please join us in five, six, seven, eight. Hi, everyone. Today with us, we have Joanne Whitehill, Artistic Director of Brooklyn Ballet Theater. We're really excited to have her. I actually had her growing up. My ballet school had a wonderful connection with Joanne, allowing us to have her for classes and rehearsals quite frequently. And Joanne is a very uh, welcoming teacher, I can say from experience. And I've had a wonderful time getting to know her over the years and excited to have her here today and to learn a little bit more about her. So welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being on our podcast, Joanne. And going forward, I just want to ask you, can you share us, share with us a little bit about your training growing up in Connecticut, as well as your professional experience? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, at a very, very tiny, when I first started dancing, I was at a recreation department just taking general classes. And the teacher there pulled about eight or 10 of us out of that and invited us to her private studio, which was actually in her home. So we went there and had classes. And that was when I was, I don't know, seven or eight. Um, I studied with her until that was Aileen Valenti and the Petite Ballet in Brantford. I um, studied with them until I was about 10 or 11 years old. And then I went and studied at a place called Connecticut Ballet which doesn't exist anymore. Um, Connecticut Ballet turned into New Haven Ballet. There is another Connecticut Ballet. I studied with Bob Vickery and um, Robin Welch. Um, And it was in New Haven, Connecticut. So it was a big thing for me to get on the city bus and take the bus into the city, which is not really a city, but at that point and that age, it was a, a big commitment. And it took a lot of discipline to make sure I had my bus money and, um, it was, it was a great learning experience for me to, to do. Um, there was a professional company and we had teachers from the company teaching us. So I had a, a huge array of teachers from Balanchine to Chiquetti to Vaganova and a mix of everything in between. So it really set me up to go on to dance professionally. Um, I danced in several small companies. I was a big fish in a little sea and a little fish in a big sea. And it really helped to shape me as a teacher. Um, I was in uh, Tennessee at Allegro Dance Theater with a woman from England. So that was more an RAD style. Um, But there Violet Verdi came in and coached us. I was at Vermont Ballet Theater um, where there was just a a plethora of teachers. I danced with the Scottish American Ballet uh, with a man by the name of Alexander Bennett who was partnered, who partnered Margot Fontaine. So he whistled every ballet and um, was just so full of historic information. Um, Worked with Arthur Leaf there as well. Uh, From there, Those were all pretty much big fish in little oceans. Um, Then I went on to uh, Oregon Ballet Theater and Nevada Dance Theater. And I would say those were sort of the biggest professional companies that I worked with. Um, And again, some some English people, some uh, Balanchine trained people in Oregon, Pacific Northwest Ballet is right up there. So we had a lot more Balanchine people. Patricia Brewer-Jones, who I was teaching with as well, she actually trained with Balanchine. So to watch her teaching the Balanchine style and um, having a a long body with hyperextended legs, it just seemed to fit me and it was great to see that. So um, sort of been all over, lots of different size schools and companies and trainings um, and loved every minute of it. Yeah, that sounds so exciting. And I can just tell how each experience has shaped you. And I'm sure you're taking everything that you learned uh, and you're bringing it into your professional career as the director of Brooklyn Brooklyn Ballet. So that's all really wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think I quite realized how like varied your experience was in terms of all the different companies. It's really wonderful. And I also think it's just so funny. It's a small world because 
I grew up in North Brantford, not too far from Brantford, and I trained at New Haven Ballet until I was about 12. So it's just uh, kind of funny to, to have some of those overlaps. Yes. Um, and Ruth Barker. Uh, oh, love Ruth. A, yeah. And she was another Balanchine dancer and just watching her um, was just, it, again, it was a style that fit me and, and the joy and the love and the musicality. So yeah, it, the was dance she, world is small, as you well know. Yes. Was she dancing there when you were there or teaching? She was, um, she was a little bit of both. She was coming back from SAB and some of the other places that she had been. And she grew up in Connecticut and then she went off and did things. And so she was coming back. So oh, very she cool. would take class with us sometimes. She would teach sometimes. Um, you know, we all go through those transitions. And right. Yeah, I still that. take some open classes from her from time to time when I'm back home in Connecticut. That's, that's really cool. And sometimes I think that's like, taking class with someone and watching them is almost as valuable as them teaching because you're really, they're modeling what they really do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So something I didn't know about you was that you have your degree in elementary education. So did you go for this with the intent of using it for teaching dance or did you ever like have another goal in mind or find yourself taking another outside job other than what you do with Berkeley? So I think that a lot of people are probably in the same situation now. I was a senior in high school and Connecticut Ballet, New Haven Ballet was going through a huge transition. And so I didn't have any concept that I could go on to a professional career. And I, again, I, I love the teachers and by no fault of theirs, but it wasn't explained to me. I didn't know, I didn't have any mentors telling me what I needed to do and even saying a professional career would be an option. And at the same time, I had my family who was saying, you need to go to college. Um, so I had always loved teaching ballet. I started teaching ballet in the program at the Brantford Recreation Department that I started in. I started teaching there when I was probably 15 or 16. So I've always enjoyed teaching um, my mother was a librarian, my sister is a school teacher, so I think teaching just sort of runs in the family as well. And I had such a great ballet life that I didn't want to leave the area. And Southern Connecticut State University had a fantastic teaching program. So sort of on a whim and because I didn't want to leave the area, I said, okay, I'll be a teacher. <laughs> so I went to school and, and got my degree um, I have a Bachelor of Science in, in Elementary Education and a minor in Dance. Very cool. And going off of that, what from your studies in elementary education most relates to your current teaching experience at Brooklyn Ballet? Um, really understanding how people's brains work. Um, when, you, when you're learning to be a school teacher, you're really learning how people take in information and whether they're a kinesthetic learner or an a, a auditory learner or a visual learner. And that really plays into being in the studio. Um, for someone who's a kinesthetic learner to tell them to stand still and watch you while learning the combination just isn't going to work. And I feel like I have a unique understanding of that from the training that I did in education. And um, so there's, there's lots of little things like that that I find have really shaped how I teach. Um, and again, although it was elementary education, it was all about how people learn. And for me being a ballet teacher, how people learn is so important to me because I want to pass the information on in six different ways if that's what it takes for kids to understand or people to understand what it is that I'm trying to get across. So it, the, the education training was absolutely invaluable. And the other way is just in disciplining um, young children and, and learning how to work with them in a positive way rather than just reprimanding them. And I'm learning now, it, it really plays over to even adults. No one wants to be, they're, they're not gonna respond to constantly being reprimanded, but if you're giving them some something to attain and something to rise up to, it, it makes a huge difference. I think that that is so valuable and, and really wonderful that you have that kind of background. I think there's lots of teachers out there teaching dance that don't have enough insight to those kinds of things. And 
even I went through the whole EBT national training curriculum teacher certification last year during my time at NYU. And there are a lot of psychology kind of components embedded in the training that we get to become a certified EBT NTC teacher. But I, you know, that was only like a little, little taste, a little dive in. And so getting your whole degree surrounding that, I think that's so valuable to the dance field for sure. Yeah. And if, people, if, if kids going on to college, uh, ask me what, what they should take classes in if they really want to teach dancing or if, you know, they're not sure what they want to do. I, I really recommend that they take some classes in how people learn, whether it's an elementary version or an older version, because I do think it really, it makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you can see the correlation between teaching in general and then bringing it to dance. I could see how that's very reflective and so important and valuable as we have been saying. Yeah. So I just think that's really interesting. And I think it would be fun to see how other teachers could benefit from that kind of experience. Like let's say other teachers went to get their degree in education. Maybe that would help influence or change the way they perceive their teaching as well. So I think what you're doing is really, really neat and, and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of happened by an act by accident, but you know, I, I really think it was, it was a great accident to have happen. I recently met someone who got their degree I think from University of Arizona and they got it in dance pedagogy mm -hmm. and I'm eager to talk with her more about the kinds of classes that she took to get the degree in pedagogy and did they have classes in how people learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah no that would be really interesting to hear. I got a minor in dance pedagogy when I was at Mercyhurst and then my master's last year in dance education and it it is interesting to kind of just personally compare what it was like going for a BFA to then switching gears towards dance education and just how that was very different. And while we did have a lot of things within my dance education program that really, I think have helped me in my teaching, I can't say that we necessarily had like one specific course or kind of section where we necessarily talked about like the different types of learning. Like, I feel like we, it would come up here and there, but it'd be interesting to compare different programs and what specifically is being offered. Absolutely. And I know you have a lot of experience in, in how people learn. You didn't get it necessarily through college, but from doing the adaptive program, you I'm sure had to figure out ways to, to teach kids and, and kids with disabilities. So trial by fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think a lot of it too is as much as you can learn so much about theory and this and that, a, a lot of it is also just being put in the room with children and just having to, to do it and find your own solutions and figure out how to think, make things work. But I definitely think that all of that experience with the adaptive program, which we actually had Deb on an earlier episode talking about the program um, to our audience, it, it has taught me a lot. It really has. Um, so I really value those experiences and to this day have continued finding different ways to teach people with different disabilities throughout my career thus far. So I do some online classes and some private lessons and stuff, which have been really, really enjoyable. Yeah. I'm very proud that you're still teaching, that you've, you're sort of going into that as well. So I oh, think you. Maybe, maybe a few little things that I did that will go with you. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> no, I really do value and think back to my time in high school and having classes from you and rehearsals. And even a few years ago, when I came back to do the Nutcracker when I was in college, and I remember you were there with us that weekend, giving us warm up class and everything. So I definitely take all of those, those memories and lessons along with me for sure. Yeah. And I think teachers really do give us perspective and they change our lives and they, they are the ones that, you know, sculpt us into who we are as dancers and then future teachers. So I give a lot of credit to anyone who teaches. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So right now is probably a good time to take a break. We'll be right back. Here's a word from our sponsor. Hi everyone, we're back and we're gonna switch gears a little bit to talk to Joanne about Brooklyn Ballet. So can you just give us a little bit about just the organization itself and 
what your program offers. Sure. Um, we are only a summer intensive, and I sort of hate to say only because there's so much to a summer intensive. So the only part comes in, we just happen during the summer. We do not have a year round school, which gives us more time to focus on the summer and the intensive training. Um, Berkeley offers intensive training in classical ballet. We do include modern, contemporary, um, some musical theater, all, all that goes with the intensives. Um, the biggest difference with Berkeley Ballet Theater is that at the end of each week, we do a fully produced performance. So that means we have a lighting designer on staff, we have a technical crew, we have a costume designer and a costumer on staff. So um, the dancers arrive and they have three classes a day and rehearse for the week while staying in college dorms and eating in the cafeteria. And then on Saturday night, every dancer who's there performs, which as you can imagine is not only intensive, but or physically intensive, but emotionally intensive uh, as well. Um, they have to come for at least two weeks. And, you know, uh, we say week one is, is getting used to the program. And then week two, you can actually look around and realize how much you're getting and how much progress you've made. Um, the dancers can stay from two to six weeks. And then we do take a small group of dancers to Edinburgh, Scotland to perform there as well. Um, so we're everything that you would expect in an intensive and, and more because most intensives don't do the performance. Um, I think one thing that I really try to do with Berkeley is teach dancers how to exist in the professional world. That's a, a passion of mine so that they don't crash and burn when they get there and don't get the casting that they were hoping for, but they understand and, and learn a little bit how to navigate that. Great, thank you. And like you said, I mean, I've heard of a few summer intensives where there are a lot of performance opportunities, but I definitely think that Berkeley is one that stands out in this way of, especially if you're someone who's attending all six weeks, I mean, that's a lot of performing experience kind of jam packed in such a short period of time and with a quick turnaround from, from week to week. So I think there's a lot of value to that, especially for maybe some students who come from smaller schools around the country where maybe their schools cannot put on giant performances or productions or do full length ballets or not saying that that's necessarily what you do, but doing things that they they don't get the opportunity to back home. So that's really right. wonderful. And, and we do excerpts from full length ballets. Mm -hmm. we, we'll do the whole third act of Sleeping Beauty with mm -hmm. uh, Red Riding Hood and the Bluebird yeah. and all of that. So by doing that, people can be rehearsing at the same time and we put it all together. Mm -hmm. um, what I've learned, which may be interesting for you and your listeners is a lot of the smaller schools, the dancers and students do get performing experience. It's actually some of the larger schools where the companies do all the performing and maybe they get a small role in Nutcracker, but maybe not so much. So, um, that was a, a surprising thing for me to learn and, and find out that some dancers are getting trained and are technically beautiful, but don't have the experience of performing. So coming to Berkeley is a, a great thing for them because they can get a high level of training. And like you said, if they're there for six weeks, they do six performances. So um, it it's it lights the fire under them and it certainly is intense. Um, but again, we help to nurture them and calm them down and help them to understand that perfection is not what we're going for in a week. Obviously we want it to be as strong as it can, but it's about the process of getting yourself through that. Yeah. And I think that's probably a good way too, for younger dancers to prepare for, say, if they want to pursue a professional career and just having that you know, intense week where they have to learn all the choreography in a shorter period of time and all of that. I think that those are also valuable skills on top of the actual performance itself, but the preparation in, in such a short period of time. There's an organization called Regional Dance America. Um, and we uh, get a fair amount of our students from schools that belong to that organization. And 
some of the teachers there say they can see which of their kids have been to Birkeland and which have not because of exactly that, how they process the information and how they can learn choreography. So um, I, I think that plays over into school and life and everything else. Um, but of course, we practice it and hone that skill in the ballet studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a huge compliment. So congratulations that you yeah. know, we can literally see a difference between those who have come to your program versus those who haven't. So yeah, congratulations. Thank you. And I, you know, I give a lot of credit to the kids, but you know, yeah, I'm really proud of the fact that, that we got that compliment and that we're helping dancers in general. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I just wanted to ask a little bit about the Scotland experience. So that festival that you take students to attend, can you just tell us a little bit about that and maybe some of the greatest like takeaways for these students that get to experience this? Yeah, um, so the Edinburgh Festival is the largest arts festival in the world. And the main festival brings companies like Miami City Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, um, and, and lots of other arts organizations, um, music groups, orchestras, symphonies. Uh, they bring, the, the main festival brings those people in. And then there's the other part of it, um, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival or Festival Fringe. And those are the smaller groups that self-present, but it's a great conglomeration of lots of arts people. So we take a group of dancers. Um, they come to Vermont for four weeks from all over the United States. We've even had a couple of people from um, France and Switzerland join us. Um, they come to Vermont for the last four weeks of our program. And not only do they rehearse for the weekly performances, but we're putting together a one hour children's ballet. Uh, so we do Cinderella, um, Snow White, The Little Mermaid, Alice in Wonderland. So we're putting that together on top of it. We spend the four weeks doing that. We do a preview of our Scotland performance, but we do it in Vermont so people in this country can see it. And then we get on a plane and we fly to Scotland and um, we get off very jet lagged but um, we all sort of link arms and make it around the city without losing anyone. And we rehearse for two days and then we open and we do about nine performances every morning. Um, and it's a children's show. So at the end of the performance, the audience is invited on stage to meet the dancers and touch their costumes and their point shoes. So we do a performance every morning. We have a little company meeting and then the dancers break off in groups with their chaperones and they go and explore the historic city of Edinburgh and the area around it um, and see other shows and of course do shopping. Um, but really a lot of them go and see some of the historic stuff, which is, is really a fantastic thing. Um, most memorable, I think for a lot of the kids is seeing young children being intrigued and in love with their dancing and kids who wanna have their pictures taken and kids who try to go on their toes. Um, I think some of the dancers are not used to that level of appreciation. And I think that gives them a, a little bit of a different view of what it's like to be on stage. Um, we've had a couple of dancers and I think that these are just amazing stories. Um, one dancer went to the festival with us and performed and then later went back to go to college at Edinburgh University because she fell in love with Edinburgh when she was there with us. And she came to a performance during the Fringe and she came up and she didn't expect us to know who she was. And I said, oh my goodness. And I knew who she was. And then she told me the whole story and I had no idea. But um, I thought, wow, this program really does have an impact on the dancers. And then another girl who went with us um, went to college in the States to get a degree in arts administration and she needed an internship. So she actually got an internship with the main festival. Oh, wow. That's so, amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So just to know that um, these opportunities can just affect each dancer in a different way and you know neither one of them were still dancing but they were still really in, involved with it and the program had a big impact on their lives so um, that was fantastic um, every now and again we get a college essay 
um, that's been written about Birkeland. And um, again, it's just whether it's Scotland or, or just the, the program in Vermont, it's it really reminds me of how much of an impact we as teachers and as dancers have on the people around us. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just love that you have that Scotland component. I feel like that's so unique to your program. Uh, and I could totally see, like if I had known that that was a thing or that the program was even a thing, being in Syracuse, New York, I didn't really know about the Berklin opportunity. But had I known, I would have loved to do something like that. So I hope our listeners, you know, if you're younger, please go check this out. This is a wonderful experience for you. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And, you know, I think um, everybody gets uh, their own unique things about it. We've taken a couple of dancers who were injured um, and couldn't really dance, but they weren't so injured that they couldn't walk around. And even they got a lot out of being around backstage and things. So, um, you know, it's just important to take every opportunity that you can. So yes, I would appreciate it if people look this up and we love emails and social media posts and things. So ask any questions because we're all about sharing information. So let us know, send us questions. That's great. Um, so now switching gears a little bit, how is Brooklyn Ballet dealing with COVID-19 pandemic? I know that's gotta well, be tough. <laughs> it's a challenge. Um, the the pandemic hit in March, as everyone knows of whatever year, because I've just wiped that out of my head because it's been going on so long now. Um, we had already completed our audition tour and had everything in place for the summer to happen. And so we really tried to make the program happen that year. Um, we, Berkman is sort of its own little pod because we're housed on the campus of Northern Vermont University in Johnson, Vermont. And the campus is on top of a hill and you really have no need to leave campus. So once you get there after the original seven or 14 days, we really viewed ourselves as a pod. And so we really thought we can do this. If everybody tests before we get there, we can do it. The long and the short of it is when it came right down to it, too many people coming into the area, going to the grocery store to buy supplies, I would have been devastated if we brought COVID to this very small community. So in the end, we had to cancel for a season, um, which was just devastating to everyone and, and left a big hole for us. And we really contemplated about doing a virtual program, but so much of Berkeley is um, the nurturing and teaching people how to get through things and the performance aspect of it that we really decided there was no way to replicate that in a virtual program. Sure, we could teach classes, we could teach choreography, but the camaraderie and unity of it was not there. So we opted to not run a program. We did teach some virtual classes and um, it, it was sad, but I actually had a really good time with it because I had my bar and I had my teaching sneakers and I would go on campus and I would take the internet from the buildings, but I would be standing outside teaching. So the dancers were actually almost feeling like they were on campus because they were taking class and seeing me in the different places. Um, so, you know, we just tried to offer those opportunities and have a couple of meet and greets. Um, I think the the biggest show of support for me and the program um, was we did a free virtual class on what would have been the opening day of Berkeley. And we had 81 dancers in that virtual class. And to me, I was like, okay, that's our community showing up and everyone's okay and understands. Um, we tried to support as many performances of the students who come to Berkeley and the companies, uh, Western Arkansas Ballet, Vail Valley, um, Vineland Regional Dance, uh, just lots of schools that send us a lot of kids. We tried to promote them and any kind of virtual performances that they were doing. Um, 
we, like I said, we did some meet and greets. We did um, some signs and, you know, just tried to connect with people via social media, but not being in a place, it was hard to do anything. Um, I had an idea to do a compilation of nutcrackers um, and, and let people sign up and one group do read flutes and another group do merlatons and another group do this. And then they would send us all the videos and we would put it together. But it didn't go because it was just too much at that time with COVID. And if they were trying to do their own virtual things, that was sort of the last thing that I wanted was to take away from them. I really felt like that was our time to turn around and support the schools that dancers had been coming to us from for so many years. So turn around and do anything that we could for them. Um, in 2021, we were able to do a program. We generally offer a three week version and we had to do away with our three week session. So it was two, four or six weeks. So we had dancers coming in and out at specific times. Um, and we were able to do everything again because we were a pod. Um, we, we had the COVID scare and um, it was a cold, which, you know, everybody had, we didn't have, we didn't, if you were vaccinated, you did not have to wear a mask. So that was fantastic. And then we did get a head cold that was sort of running around campus, which made us all nervous, but we did the appropriate things and did testing and separated and everybody was fine. And then we were like, okay, get a cold. It's just a cold. <laughs> um, it was a lot of relief and seeing the dancers um, and their excitement to be back on stage performing live in front of an audience was just fantastic. Um, and it was people, we, we get audiences of parents, but not only that, it was people from the area um, of Johnson who were coming into the performances. And again, just so, so happy to see live performances. Um, That's so great. It sounds like you really did make the most of all we've been given over these last couple of years. And also, it's just so nice to hear too, you're wanting to give back and really keeping in mind and considering the people that have supported and been a part of your community at Berkeley over the years. I, I think sometimes, you know, people are selfish and it sounds like you did a really selfless thing, uh, giving back in ways you, you could. So props to you. <laughs> and we try. I mean, that's, that's something that we want to do is give back. And so we try. Yeah. And now, so as you mentioned, Berklin only offers programs in the summer itself, but it sounds like this is always kind of a moving, working, functioning thing year round in terms of preparation, or is it not as necessarily labor intensive during the year itself? Can you just speak on that a little bit? Um, when the program ends in August, I take usually two or three weeks and just try to recuperate and, and rest a little bit. Um, but that is something about the community. Once, once we roll into September, it's time to start setting up the audition tour and checking in with people. Um, you know, I, I get to know every dancer that's there. So if somebody's had an injury or an illness during the summer, I want to reach back out to them and say, Hey, how's it going? Have you recovered? Um, I'm always interested to get feedback from people. So, you know, picking a few individuals and saying, what was your experience like? Um, you know, things like that. And the planning of it start again in September, October. Um, and thinking about what can we do better? What can we do different? What, what do we want to add? Who was, a, who was a really inspiring teacher? And, you know, who do we really, really want to have back? And so yeah, it, it starts pretty, pretty quickly. Um, if it's been a Scotland year, now we go to Scotland every other year. So we're planning for Scotland before we even leave Scotland, um, checking out other venues and seeing um, places to stay and, and things that we might want to do in the future that we really need to see in person before we leave. Um, then November, uh, November, December is really setting up the audition tour. The audition tour is January to March. And then April, May, we sort of get a breather from the physical work, um, but that's sending out the acceptances and getting in place, getting everything in place. And then May, June, we really ramp up and then it's there again. <laughs> um, the other unique thing about Berkeley is that 
we have storage units and everything goes in the storage units when we leave campus. And so we go back about a week before the program starts and we unload everything out of campus, everything out of the storage units onto campus. And that includes sprung floors, Marley floors, bars, mirrors, all the costumes. Um, it seems a little crazy sometimes to do for just six weeks, but when we're there and the impact that we have makes it all worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we feel like Brigadoon because we just rise up and then we just kind of disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's what I say too. <laughs> So in terms of the audition tour, I know that you have auditions pretty much all over the country. What are you kind of looking for when you're auditioning students as someone, as an artistic director? If you don't mind sharing, giving a little bit of insight without, you know, spilling too much. <laughs> no, no, I think it's important for dancers and in some cases, teachers to understand what any director is looking for. And I would guess that it's different for different directors. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, first and foremost, we're looking for a level of technique that can handle um, and can progress. So you don't have to be the top dancer. We also like to work with dancers. So if you have a good basis of your technique, but I feel like we can make a difference in your life, I want you to come to Berkman because I, I want to fix things. Um, really dancers have to be strong enough. Uh, if you're dancing, you know, you're taking three classes a day plus at least two to three hours of rehearsal, that's a lot of dancing. So mm -hmm. physically you have to have the strength. Um, for me mentally, again, because it takes the mental side of it as well, if you mess up a combination and you dissolve into tears, I, I care about you, but Berkeley is not the right place for you because there's so many times where it's hard. Um, so a little mental perseverance as well, um, being able to sort of laugh at yourself and go, that was terrible. I'm gonna try better, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna do better on the next one, which sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a big one. You have to have the awareness of your space so that you're not going to be in the way of other dancers. Um, sometimes that's, believe it or not, the, the last line of should we accept a dancer or not. If they have the technique and they're strong enough, but maybe they're not quite there, if they have the passion and they're really working, the last thing I say is, okay, are they going to hurt themselves? And if the answer is no, I say, are they going to hurt other dancers? Are they spatially aware enough that they can go across the floor without hitting someone else or getting hit. And, you know, I think that that's something that even some of the most talented dancers lose sometimes in that they don't think about or don't have the spatial awareness to know, you know, am I traveling too much? Am I not traveling enough? Um, and, and passion, really, we want to impart love of dance in the students who come and we want them to advance. And if they are passionate and they want to be there learning, whether they're gonna be professional dancers or not, I, I don't care. You want to come and train in a professional atmosphere and you'll put that effort into it. I would love to have you join us. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that insight. You're yeah, welcome. I, I loved hearing you talk about that. I think it's really beautiful. And, and this kind of ties into our last and final question, but do you have any general advice for younger students seeking out a summer intensive to attend slash the audition process in general? Like, again, you kind of, kind of just spoke on it, but um, is there any, anything else, like any tips or tricks you could give them? Um, there are. And, and the first thing would be um, lots of dancers show up in a black leotard and pink tights and you all look lovely but you also all look very much the same. So do not put sparkles all over you. You do not need to wear a three color leotard, but just a, a, a nice thing in your hair or a distinct earring or something that, lead, that, that can leave an impression. And everybody can say, oh, did you see the girl with the floral earring or something like that? 
um, it makes a difference. And then, you know, I think in, in choosing a summer intensive to not just audition for, but attend, I think everybody should audition for any program, any, anything they can. I think auditioning builds strength and gives you so much information. Um, I do think that dancers, young dancers especially, need to ask themselves what they want out of a summer intensive. And really, it, it's sort of like a precursor for picking a college. Ask yourself what you want out of a program and then go to the auditions and see if you're seeming to get that out of it. Um, a little bit I touched on, you know, if you mess up a combination, it is not the end of the world. We, we mess up combinations as teachers. Mm -hmm. So the recovery is the important part. Um, mental stability, just, just being okay with whatever's going on in the audition. Um, the first time I ever auditioned for Berkman Ballet Theater, the person who ran the audition, um, did not leave me with the best impression. I didn't feel like some of the comments that were made, and, and I love her dearly, so I'm not gonna say her name or the comments, but some of the things that she said during the audition, I took as they were negative, but I still held my head up and I still completed the audition being a professional. And when I left the audition, I turned around and I thanked her for giving us the audition and things. and that's where I got my start because she remembered me and asked me one of, her, she was doing a pickup company and one of her dancers got hurt and she asked me to be a part of her company. So I think no matter what's going on in an audition, act professionally and you don't ever have to be involved with those people again, but you have to own how you are and that sets a tone. And I think people really respect that. Mm -hmm. And last thing, just enjoy the audition process. Let people see that you love dancing. Don't get so hung up in, I have to have perfect turnout or a leg that you know goes all the way up. Yeah, very wise advice and something we can all implement in all aspects of our lives, not just dance. I think it's important to love everything that you do and to show that. And that's how you will stand out and being professional always. Absolutely, just really great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I also loved, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I loved the comparison about, you know, choosing it and looking or auditioning and choosing a program kind of as the precursor to doing so if you plan to attend college. I think in a lot of ways, they're very similar and it's it's a good kind of warm up to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we all know whether it's college or which job you're going to get offered right. and which job you're going to take. It's all it's all part of the, the learning. But <laughs> I think so many dancers just go to a program because their friend is going or because it's a big name. And I think that is a mistake. It, it doesn't serve the people. And one of the things um, at Berkman that we talk about on day one is you need the, uh, to honor the people who got you where you are. Someone worked hard. And in some cases, the kids work hard themselves. So really think about where you're spending that money and that effort. Absolutely. Yeah. The big name programs aren't, aren't always the best. And sometimes you get lost in those because they're more money makers and that kind of thing they don't care and give as much individual I shouldn't say they don't care but they don't give the same level of individual care towards each student at times and and one of the things that I find teachers are encouraging their kids to go to programs that have a professional company attached because they might get asked to stay on as a trainee and while that is very valid um, networking and having two different teachers each week and seeing so many different people really can almost um, open more doors than just one place that might ask you to stay on for the summer. We currently have something like um, seven dancers at Louisville Ballet who have been through Berkman. Um, we've had many, many dancers at Ballet Theater Maryland. Um, when, when Diana was there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just meeting our counselors and seeing where they are and even what college programs they've gone to um, 
and I think networking, which is hard for younger people to do. And I, I find sometimes the dancers have a hard time promoting themselves. And again, being in a smaller program where can, they can talk with more people and get insight um, can be really valuable. But the main thing is picking the program that works the best for you. If, if one of those big programs is what works for you, I support that. Just don't forget about the little guys because they might be what you need to. Right, right. Yeah, value to both. And, and like you said earlier, depending on what you're looking for to and to get out of your experience. All right. Well, I feel like this is a great place to end our conversation, but we can't thank you enough for coming on. This was so great. I really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know you and learning about your program. So well, thank you. It really, you know, like I said, I... I, we are only a summer intensive. So sometimes connecting with other people who are in the same boat as me can be difficult. So I really enjoy um, talking to you guys and, and meeting you, Hannah. And just, again, just talking about dance, I think is really important. Um, and it helps people understand what direction they want to go with. Um, so Hannah, we have counselor opportunities also. So, you know, it's not too late. <laughs> Hey, maybe I'll pick you up on that. <laughs> I would love that, honestly. Yeah, and look us up. And, yeah, everyone who's listening, especially if you know someone who's looking for a summer intensive, I highly recommend the program. While I, I never attended myself, I have many friends growing up who did and always spoke very highly. And I, I just know from knowing Joanne that it's a wonderful program. So. Yeah, so check out her website. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Joanne. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Abundance. We appreciate your support. We hope to have PK in your interest. Feel free to contact us at AbundancePodcast5678 at gmail.com and give us feedback on what you'd like to hear. That is Abundance without parentheses. Go dance yourself silly. Bye for now. A special thank you to Richard DeFiore for our lovely podcast tune and Matt Mellish for our cover art.